This is 757 Saturday Sports Talk with Matt Hatfield on ESPN Radio 94.1. Hour two now of 757 Saturday Sports Talk brought to you by Larry King Law on the sixth day of March, the year 2021. Matt Hatfield here with you. And this time we're joined by a special guest. He is the publisher of Tar Hill Illustrated. That's NorthCarolina.rivals.com. It's the UNC site on the Rivals network of sites powered by Yahoo Sports. Check out his work and everything on Twitter too at Heel Illustrated. We say hello to our pal Andrew Jones here. Uh, Andrew, how's life treating you? Awesome, man. My friend, Matt Hatfield. Good to talk to you, buddy. How you doing? Doing well. Same here. And uh, how different have things been this season in contrast to, say, at this time a year ago where the Heels were out early in the ACC tournament at the hands of Syracuse and then the whole sports world went down the tubes? You know, the funny thing about last year's team is that uh, they were annihilated that night by Syracuse. They, in, in a really bad year, that was about as poorly as they played. Mm-hmm. And yet, they had this weird distinction of basically saying, hey, we were the last ACC team to play a basketball game. <laughs> uh, that was the COVID beginning of the crazy COVID era, and we're still in it. We're, we're slowly climbing out because there were people at the Dean Dome last week, and there will be 3,263 of them there again today. But um, it has been an unreal year, and for North Carolina basketball, it has been an unreal 15 months. Unlike Other than the 20, uh, 2002 season, it's been so out of character. It's actually been very fascinating to cover. Well, let's set the scene here for folks. Uh, UNC coming in a uh, better shape than Duke at fifteen and nine overall, nine and six in the ACC. They're forty fifth in the net right now. The Blue Devils, eleven and ten, just a game over five hundred nine and eight in the ACC. They're fifty eighth in the net. UNC coming off that seventy two. 70 loss at Syracuse on Monday night where they almost pulled off an amazing comeback there. Dukes lost a couple of overtime games here uh, lately. Georgia Tech on Tuesday, Louisville before that. Um, Who can a win boost more, UNC or Duke, and who gets damaged by a loss more, UNC or Duke? I think think Duke is the answer to both questions because if the Devils lose today, they have to win the ACC tournament, I think. Uh, Carolina just has to win another game, I think. If they win today, they're in. If they don't win today, they actually could play Duke again Wednesday. In fact, if they don't win today, it's very likely they would be the eight and Duke would be the nine. Crazy. Can you imagine? (laughs) Another COVID casualty would be Duke and North Carolina playing on Wednesday in the ACC tournament. So um, I think Duke can help themselves a lot, but they're going to have to win a few more games. They would have to beat Carolina twice in five days. And, I don't know if they can do that. Uh, the Devils have a lot of issues. So the Carolina has issues too, but I think that they're a better team. They're more fortified, and they're and they're certainly better down low. There's one thing Carolina does well every game, and that's rebound. And I'm not sure that there's one thing Duke does well every game. And that's been a four Taylor. So they've had so many great rebounders over the years. You think back to Sean May and Tyler Hansbro and John yeah. Henson, all those guys they've had. It's been a certainly a staple of Roy Williams's program there. And they were plus seven on the glass the last game. And a guy from our state, Armando Bacot, uh, playing rather well for them in the paint. And uh, the last time they played, 50 points in the second half. They beat the Blue Devils 91 to 87. As you look inside the matchup, how different are these teams from the previous meeting? I mean, Duke showed some glimpses of being better defensively, but I think. The constants have been more there with UNC than Duke. Yeah, but I, I think Duke's better. Okay. Yeah, you know, they the last two games they lost in overtime, and they were a possession away from winning both games. And that would then, had they done so, they would come in on a six game winning streak. So I think that Duke is playing better. Uh, addition by subtraction with Jalen Johnson leaving, I do think they're a better team without him. In part because uh, Coach K has finally just given away, and he's playing Mark Williams, a seven foot freshman down the post. And he actually makes them better defensively because he gives them a rim protector. And, and you covered basketball for years. You know that if there's a rim protector, guys can take a few more chances. They can overplay a little bit more outside. They can get in a, get in a, in a dude's grill because there's that guy back there all the time. And I think it does make Duke a little bit better. And he played 15 minutes in the first game, but that was his second or third game in which K was finally giving him time to play. And I don't think he had the confidence he does now. So I think he's going to be a factor for Carolina to have to deal with today, especially considering that Armando Baycott, like you just mentioned, and Daron Sharp, Garrison Brooks, their Walker Kessler, their game is inside. Carolina's an inside-outside team, and they haven't played many clubs that have seven-footers that can turn stuff away on a regular basis. So that, I think, will be where Carolina's challenge will be on the offensive end. And on the other end, They've got to keep Matthew Hurt from getting touches. He only attempted six shots in the first game. He, put, he only played 21 minutes because he had foul trouble. 
but he had only one shot attempt in the first 10 minutes before he picked up his second foul. So the philosophy that Carolina used in that game, they must employ that again today because if they don't and Hurt starts getting free with some shots – and they start scrambling, trying to, to get it, to go after him. Once he gets the ball, it's going to open up threes for other guys. And perimeter wide open threes by opponents have killed Carolina this year. Well, that leads me to my next one. We're talking with Andrew Jones, the publisher of Tar Heel Illustrated. Follow them on Twitter at Heel Illustrated, NorthCarolina.Rivals.com. It's a 757 Saturday Sports Talk here on ESPN Radio 94.1. As we get you set for the colossal ACC matchup with the uh, – Best rivalry in college basketball. We'll just say it as it is. It is the best rivalry there is with UNC and Duke tonight. Uh, Armando Baycott versus Mark Williams. Me as a guy in the Commonwealth, that's the matchup that's the spiciest yeah. to me. Is that going to – and he's the guy leading UNC in scoring right now. 11.5 points per game. One of the six guys between 7.9 and almost 12 points for them. So very balanced there. Is that the matchup tonight that's going to determine this thing? Or is it going to be what Hurt does? Can they shut him down or does he go off? Well, Armando is the most capable of Carolina's big men at getting another big on his hip, and that's where you draw a lot of fouls. And a guy like Mark Williams, who's longer than Armando, you know, if he gets him on a few reaches, if he gets him on a few body deals when he gets him on his hip, he can get him in foul trouble, and that'll be their mission. Roy Williams has never made any bones about it. Their mission is to get the opposing team's bigs and best players in foul trouble. Because if you get them in foul trouble and they're on the bench sitting next to the coach, they can't hurt you on the floor. It's a very simple philosophy, and they've had a lot of success doing that for years. He had a lot of success doing that when he was at Kansas. And Armando is probably the most likely Tar Heel because he's the strongest probably of the big guys, and he has probably the, 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 uh, the most finesse to his game. Dayron Sharp might be physically stronger, but I'm not sure he's basketball stronger yet. He's still trying to refine uh, a very raw game. So I would say Armando would be the key matchup to start things out with. And it'll be interesting to see what Walker Kessler can do because he's a very different player. And he might force uh, Williams to move his feet a little bit more, maybe get out of position a little bit more. So I clearly think North Carolina's mission going in is get that big dude in foul trouble. And if they do that, they'll feel pretty good about things. You've covered this rivalry for a long, long time. What is it that sets it apart from others in all the college sports? And how different is it without the full capacity of fans? Now, from there's going to be some fans inside the Smith Center, mostly students here. But just what is it that sets it apart in your eyes? Well, you know, I've covered, I covered Duke for a long time, too. And in covering both programs, what was so fascinating is that is different as they appear on the outside, they're very similar on the inside. They, greatness kind of follows a certain path. And Coach K is great. Roy Williams is great. The programs have these standards that they live up to that are just different from other programs I've covered in, in all sports. So I think there's an internal standard that just kind of has guys at a higher level all the time. And I think they attract guys that can handle that standard. There are a lot of dudes that may get an offer from a Duke or North Carolina that goes somewhere else because maybe they can't handle the competition within the program. Maybe they can't handle the standards. So when they, when they play each other, they're kind of going up against their own barometer. And it just raises everybody's game. And let's face it, most of the time they're playing for something very significant right now it's pretty rare they're both playing for NCAA viability. We don't see that very often. But I do think we'll see the same passion out on the court today than, that we have in years past because it just brings it out. And, and the other thing about that, Matt, is I try to tell people, don't judge Carolina or don't judge Duke on how they play against each other because I believe that these games are isolated. They, they're kind of pulled out and put on the side from the regular, rest of the regular season. A guy may have a great game for Carolina against Duke or vice versa, and it doesn't mean it's going to translate into more great games. It's just an isolated situation because it's almost like these guys play or are playing in a, in, a, in a late NCAA tournament game. In fact, Coach K one time said when I was at one of his press conferences, someone asked him a similar question. He said, look, by the time these two teams get the NCAA tournament, they've already played two Final Four games. That's what it's like in the regular season, and the players know it going in, so you see just a different level of everything when they play. Yeah, the intensity is off the charts. Come on, let's see yeah. with Andrew Jones of Tar Heel Illustrated here on 757 Saturday. Sports Talk on ESPN Radio 94.1 as we get you set for the heels and the Blue Devils tonight. And, A.J., uh, about 40 or 50 games in the ACC have been canceled because of COVID-19-related issues here. And even Virginia Tech here, right here in the Commonwealth, being affected as you know their games with Louisville and NC State wiped off the board here. 
How much uncertainty is there with the ACC tournament coming up? Not just who's going to be seated where, but how they get through this before the NCAA. Because you know, for a couple of months there was so much talk about will teams even try to opt out of a conference tournament. That's a really good question. I, I can't recall off the top of my head which conference it was, but there was a, uh, a team that had uh, had a positive test and couldn't play in a conference tournament. I think yesterday. It, is it Liberty's conference? Is that how Liberty? Well, Liberty got in based on the fact that um, the team, North Alabama, who beat Florida Gulf Coast in the semis, they're still transitioning from D1, so they're not eligible for the NCAA right. tournament. So they punched their ticket that way. But no, I mean, I, I think we both somebody fully advanced, expect. Somebody advanced in a league because of a COVID test. Yes. We fully expect it's going to happen, though, don't you, before the tournament gets going for the NCAA? The, I don't know, has the ACC gone a whole week with everybody playing? No. With all their scheduled games? I don't think so. So, and we're in. Is Virginia Tech going to be able to show up in Greensboro and play? I mean, I guess they're going to get a bye till Thursday, good which question. is good for them. But, I, you know, I wrote a column about a month ago that some people thought was insane, but I was kind of looking ahead and saying, look, you know, there are so many games that need to be made up. The fact that Virginia Tech's going to play, end up playing 13 ACC games, Louisville's played 13 ACC games, is ridiculous in what was supposed to be a 20-game schedule. So I, I said, hey, why don't they just take – this coming week, and instead of playing the ACC tournament, just reschedule as many games you play as you can. Play Tuesday and Thursday, and then everybody go into a bubble Thursday because you got to have seven straight days of positive te- or of negative tests in order to participate in the NCAA tournament. Mm-hmm. So if you're playing Saturday night and you test Sunday and there's a positive, that guy or that team can't play for another week. And the, now I know the NCAA tournaments. Date, start dates are pushed back a couple of days. The, the playing games, I guess, are Thursday, Friday, and the first round is Saturday, Sunday. But that's still not going to make it easy for some teams that happen to get to a title game. Some leagues play on Sunday, so I don't know. I thought that they could get they could play the games all day long. They can get a lot of their TV money back, but they can get everybody more games, and they could get get as cl- much closer to actually finishing a conference schedule in some way. But they're going to go ahead and run the tournament. I understand why. I understand the money thing. Um, but if there was ever a year, obviously, to, to sidestep it and do something kind of crazy, this would be it. And you know what? I bet you Duke would like to have two guaranteed games next week. And I bet you North Carolina would, too. Yeah. And they sure as hell don't want to go play each other on Wednesday afternoon. So um, I think it, would, it might work out for leagues like, like, like the ACC if they having a lot of bubble teams. You get two extra games, you get two more opportunities to win games and secure spots. But it's not happening. Somebody's going to go to Greensboro and win. I wouldn't be surprised if it's someone, you know, in the middle of the pack just because of the way the league's been this year. Yeah, I wouldn't be stunned if it's a Georgia Tech. I mean, they're starting yeah. to play pretty well, and I could see one of those teams outside the top three or four seeds get it. Yeah, when I watch Georgia, for a while now, when I watch Georgia Tech, I think, you know, that's not just a team that can win several games in Greensboro, but they can win several in the NCAA tournament yes. because they're old. They're, they're getting a lot from Moses Wright, so they got something down low. They can hit shots, and Alvarado is just a baller. Mm-hmm. He's the kind, of, and he's just a man out there playing, and that's the kind of guy that can will them to a win in the NCAA tournament. It would not surprise me to see them do well in both tournaments. They're kind of built like a tournament team, especially being an older bunch, and they're an older, hungry bunch. Some older teams aren't as hungry when they get it to this point in the season. They start thinking about what they're doing next, but this is a very hungry older team. I'll get you out on this one, and I uh, preface it with the full disclosure that there's no probably answer for this. I even threw it to the uh, venerable columnist, the Hall of Famer, David Teal, several weeks back. Uh, AJ, one of my biggest sports-related fears, and we actually saw it come to light here in our state for high school basketball for the VHSL uh, playoffs, the tournament, one of the teams that was among the favorites to win it outside of the Hampton Roads area had not even COVID. It was a contact tracing deal, and they couldn't play, and they were basically eliminated from postseason play because of it. And one of my biggest sports-related fears is we get to the NCAA tournament here, whether it's a one seed a favorite like a Gonzaga or a Baylor or one of those automatic qualifiers from a mid-major, low-major D1 league, is that somebody's going to get booted from this tourney because of something COVID-related. How do you think the NCAA handles it, and how do the consumers, the fans, react to it if that does come to fruition? I don't think it'll be, you know, I know what I've been told might happen. And honestly, I have a, a good friend who works in the NCAA office in, in Indianapolis. And about every two or three weeks, he's got something different that they think may, that how they may handle it. I know what they're saying publicly, but I, but the, the, the rules are being changed behind the scenes a lot lately. You just, just look at the Big Ten with Ohio State and football. So whatever's being said right now, I'm not sure we get a week from now that that's actually going to be what's in place. Uh, I, I really can't answer that question for you. I think it would be horrible. It would be 
bad for the tournament. They are going to put everybody in a bubble. And that goes back to why I said, I told you about my idea I had a month ago. If everyone stops playing Thursday, that means they all get a week. Get to Indy, get in your bubble right away. And that way, if they're in a bubble, like what the NBA used and the NHL used one, then unless a kid strays, there's no way you're going to have positive tests. You're going to be able to complete the tournament. Everyone's just going to have to stay there. I mean, the, the, most, most of the athletes at every school are doing online classes right now anyway. All of them pretty much are. So I don't think that's going to change anything. Just stick them in one spot, hold them there as long as they're in the tournament, and that's that. That's the best way to do this, and that's the way that they probably should do it. And my understanding is that might be the attempt, but the problem is the teams will go home for a couple of days and then come back like they do typically in the NCAA tournament. So that's a heavy expense to house these teams for that long. But you know what? They're playing this tournament, and they're going to get it in because it's worth a billion dollars. So the money's there. Yeah, money talks and people walk because of it. That is Absolutely. Andrew Jones, the publisher of Tar Heel Illustrated. He and his team at NorthCarolina.Rivals.com giving you the very best coverage of UNC basketball, football, and recruiting news as you have a big one tonight with Duke at UNC. Stay well, my friend. Uh, we'll keep in touch, and we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Take care, buddy. That's Andrew Jones with us here on 757 Saturday Sports Talk as the Heels play host to the Blue Devils this evening on the Hardwood. We'll come back and you'll hear from the head football coach of Old Dominion University, Ricky Ronnie, who spoke with our man Reese Becker of VirginiaPreps.com earlier this week. Spring practice underway. You might have to wear the heavy coat, the gloves, get the mittens out, the scarf. I'm going to do that tomorrow when I'm doing field hockey. You'll hear about the Monarchs and how things are going with them. It's coming your way on ESPN Radio 94.1. 